Hello, wonderful people. This is the final talk in the Camel series. It's about a month late, but anyway, we're here now. This one is by Sultan Hassan, who is a research fellow at the Flat Iron Institute. This is part of a series, so because of that, there's no intro to camels. If you want an intro, it should be on the screen right now. If not, it's in the description. Hydrodynamical simulations are computationally expensive. They take ages to run. Most of the other camels speakers have done some variant of, here's a bunch of hydrosims, what things in them can be used to learn about the underlying cosmology. Sultan has a very bold vision, which is to instead use machine learning to replace the need to run hydrosims altogether. Well, sort of. The, the idea is to train a neural network on the entire final density field of the simulation and find a mapping between that field and a Gaussian field. And once that is achieved and you trust what it's done, you can do all the statistics you want just by sampling from that Gaussian field, which we understand. Gaussian fields are easy. And using the neural net's mapping to see what the final density field should look like without needing to run lots, lots more hydrosims. And in that sense, you don't need to worry about lost information because you're reproducing the entire measurable field, not just a summary statistic. Sultan's density that he's using is the 2D projected hydrogen density, but the principle would apply to other measurable quantities. So this is just early days and it already works quite well, as you'll see in the talk. This is definitely a space to watch. So enjoy. Welcome to Cosmology Talk, Sultan. Do you want to tell us about your work? So what I did basically here is that I have designed a generative model that uses a specific class of machine learning models, which is called normalizing flows. And this model um, is able to generate diverse new examples of the neutral hydrogen maps by the end of reionization. And this model has been trained on camels data set. And the model basically is able to generate high dimensional data set efficiently in a few seconds. It's amazing to know that it's just after 30 minutes training on a single GPU, you are able to generate very high dimensional data set in a few seconds. So this is just like broadly what is the paper about. This model, it's called H1 flow. H1 is coming from the neutral hydrogen and then flow is just coming from normalizing flows, which is the specific machine learning model. So combined together, it's H1 flow. One curiosity question already. Um, you said in 30 minutes of training on one GPU, it does very well. Does it kind of reach kind of a saturation that it's just can't get any better because the data is not of higher quality? Or what, what happens if you leave it for a week on a thousand GPUs? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the model already saturates. You already come to a point where uh, you cannot improve it much more. And that's something that we can talk about later. Yeah, but, but it's amazing that with the 30 minutes, you get that accuracy. So do you want to go into a bit more detail about the, what specific questions you were trying to answer and why those questions are important to solve? what we gain by solving them. Yeah, so I think I think what I am mainly interested in is a big deeper, probably philosophical question, which is how do we extract the maximum amount of information from data set? And then the other question is how would you prevent loss of information? And and then of course that all you need to do in order to take that maximum amount of information to translate it into some constraints onto your cosmological or ast astrophysical parameters or models. And also that will help you to understand where does information exist, right? So you, if you have a simulation, or so if you have something, you have so many type of data, right? So maybe a, a combination of different things give you the maximum amount of information. So basically this is the main motivation for the work. And it's motivated also because most of the analysis we do in cosmology or astronomy is basically we looking usually for a summary statistics. So let's say if you have like a three-dimensional data set or if you have like a two-dimensional data set like a map or a boxes, we usually try to compress them into a power spectrum, something that we can easily compute, right? In that regard, we are throwing away so much information. So the main idea about this is that let's try to keep the information and uh, look into the information as it is. And then we know this is uh, something that we already know from the convolution and neural nets in machine learning, right? We know that the convolution and neural nets achieve the state of the art performance in recovering parameter, in estimating parameter. It has been shown in many studies that the CNN outperforms all the methods if you do like poly spectrum or you do or you compress or you do anything. Although we don't need to forget that there are many methods in machine learning now it has been also applied in cosmology like information maximizing neural networks or like the wavelet uh, scattering transforms where they try to, to find optimal summary statistics to fields that they can maximize 
the information and then you preventing loss of information. But still, we know that from the CNN or the convolutional neural networks, the maximum thing is that you do your analysis at the field level. And now this is here the question comes, right? So we want to do it at the field level. How do we do this, right? The problem is that most of the state of the art hydrodynamic simulations that include many sophisticated astrophysical models to form stars and to feedback and all these things, it takes a long time to run. Even now the camels itself, it gives you only like 1000 simulations exploring six parameter dimension in the space. And that's really a very small number of simulations given the huge parameter range. It's a six dimensional parameter space. So maybe 1000 simulation is enough for three parameters, but not for six. And that's only because we are limited by the computing capabilities, the memory requirement. So now the question here, if you are able to emulate the behavior of the simulation to generate fields, because we know that the fields is the best thing to extract information from, and you don't lose anything. If you are able to create a model, that model can take the data that you gave it to from camels, and then it tries to learn the actual density and the actual likelihood of this data set. And then from there, once you capture that and you learn that, you are able to generate new examples. And in that case, now you can generate things very quickly, like in a few seconds, you get a very nice map, very close to the original one. And that helps you to, to explore the parameter space much better. It helps you to enable parameter inference. One of the problem now is that we cannot even think of a way to link hydrodynamic simulations or radiative transfer models or any one of the sophisticated astrophysical cosmological models with parameter inference scheme like MCE or by Delphi or any methods that helps you to find posterior distribution because that requires you to sample many things. So it's mainly going to the direction, okay, let's try not to lose information. Let's try work on the field level and let's do parameter inference there. And the parameter inference, it has two parts. The first part is that you need like efficient emulator or generator that is able to generate data very quickly. The second part is that we need something that can do the inference much quicker and the search in the space much quicker. So this work is not about the second part. It's basically about the first part is that let's do a simulator that is able to generate high dimensional data very quickly. And then in that case, you don't need to run camels. You don't need to run the simulation. You already captured everything. Cool. Yeah, let's let's get into the, the details of the results. Do you want to pick a few specific results and help us understand what it means? So basically, here is the comparison between camels. So at the right hand side, we have the camels data set, which is examples of the neutral hydrogen maps by the end of reionization, which is the time where I'm mainly interested in. So it's by redshift of six or so. So these are maps for the neutral hydrogen and the way that they are computed is that you look for the all neutral hydrogen at a given line of sight, and then you try to collapse your boxes of the simulation into one map. And these are the examples of the map by the right-hand side. In the left-hand side, these are examples generated by the H1 flow, the model I designed. And then in general, when you look at them, if you look at larger scales, the bigger picture, if I don't tell you which one is the camels, which one is the flow, it might be very difficult to recognize. But now, if I tell you, and if you look closer, you realize that the small scale structure is a bit different between two. And this is a problem that we know usually in cosmology and in astrophysics is that, in astrophysics specifically, because we know that if you go to smaller scales, things are really highly nonlinear, and it's very hard to capture things in a much smaller scales. Another problem is that although we train in a 30 minutes and you get that accuracy, I will show you the accuracy now, I do not really provide an actual maps to the model. So the model doesn't see the 2D structure of the maps. The model really just sees one dimensional flattened array of the images because we want the model to generate examples very, very quickly. I'm not saying that the 2D information is not there. The 2D information is still there because if you have one image and you flatten that image, you can still see the 2D information is still there. But however, the model is not built to uh, make use 
or take advantages of the 2D information, not like the convolution and neural networks where you give it a map and the map really scan the images with one filter or one kernel trying to, to capture the local information. And in that case, the model will, will do much better. But because I was interested to do something that much quicker, I tried just to go with only dense layers or with only flattened layers where you just pass an image and then after you get the output of the image from the model, you basically try to reshape it again to get to do the picture, which is basically this is what you see in the in the left hand side. But still on large scale, it's surprising that the model works. It gives you somehow uh, similar results. That's basically the differences between them. So basically, the model is able to reproduce camels. If we look now, if I move to a comparison at the level of uh, the scatter around the border spectrum, one of the things that is really, I should mention and I should stress on that is that many of the machine learning models, they do not really reproduce the scatter of any observable. So you learn something, but you are able to get one-to-one -one relation. So if you have like maps and you do CNN or something, you just, you are recovering the mean relation. But this model through the normalizing flows, which I can explain quickly if, if the time permits. But the basic idea here is that you are able with that model to do an exact density estimation. And when you do that exact density estimation, you are able to generate new examples much quicker. So just quick question, the, the y-axis here is the, was the density of neutral hydrogen. I was just coming to that. I wanted just to explain the normalizing flow much quicker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. So the normalizing flow just basically is that you start with the simple base density, which is what you see in the left, which is usually a Gaussian field. And then you have your complex density transformation in the right. In my case, the transform density, which is a more complex density signal, is my H1 maps. And this is basically, if you think about it, this is similar to what we do in cosmology, right? You start with the initial Gaussian field for the density, right? And then you try to skew that distribution by applying many recipes, right, to get what you want. And the basic idea is that you have a simple distribution, you want to convert it to complex one, and all happens just by the change of variable formula that you can apply a series of liars, uh, which is these, the F thetas from one to N. And this is just like the change of variable formula. You would require two things only. The function should be invertible and should be differentiable. If you can do that, then you can find the transformation between all of them. There are techniques here for these liars to ensure that they satisfy these two conditions. And this is all about just machine learning is stacking many liars that they should satisfy these two properties. So now once this mapping is found, then you are able quickly to generate new example from the base density. So any random number that you generate from the base density correspond to another random number in your transform density. Because you learn the exact density transformation, you can just generate new examples very quickly. And if you go from the transform density, because the, the mapping and the flow is invertible, if you go to the left, then you are able to do parameter inference. So the model is flexible that you can go backward and forward. And that's it. So I explained here, these are the differences. You can quantify the differences now between them. So what you see in the left-hand side, in the x-axis, this is the H1 column density from 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 21. And what you see in the y-axis is just this is the histogram. Let's say your testing set has 100 images, okay? Do the histogram for all the images. And now let's look for the mean histogram and the standard deviation histogram. So all the histogram as a function of your column density for each column density bin, we have all the histogram, the 100 of them. So we can just take the mean and we take the standard deviation and look at how, how they compare. And what you see here, it's really by the eye impressive that the model is able to give you very close estimation to the, what is the mean histogram and the standard deviation, which is scatter that I, that I mentioned earlier that many models that they cannot capture very well. What you see by the right hand side, it's the same. You can take the image, the power spectrum, you can calculate the power spectrum for all uh, the images in your, in, in your testing set, and then take the mean power and take the standard deviation power as a function of K bins and see the difference. And what you see here is that the agreement is very nice on large scales, right? Because anything going to the left, this is large scale, going to the right is a small scale. And you see a large scale, it's really impressive what we see in the eye, right? However, in a small scale around 0.5, you see that it's really losing information. And I'm that expect because as I mentioned, I'm not really supplying an actual map to the model and I'm trying to 
take that. I was more interested to get something much faster to generate things. So it, we know that the convolution takes time in the computation. So if you can avoid convolution, then you can generate images much faster than that. So basically, this is the impressive agreement. So what I have showed you here is that just the first attempt, which is basically let's train the model without learning the parameters. So here what you have seen, even in the previous slides, that we don't really condition the model on the parameters. It's just unconditional. This is a data set, learn it, generate it, and that's it. Okay. So then the second part is to condition on the parameter. While you are learning the mapping, you tell the mapping that this image has this value of omega matter and this value of sigma eight this value of this parameter. And this is the most interesting one. Otherwise, if you don't really condition the parameter, you cannot really do parameter inference with that, or you cannot really explore any parameter. So the main idea is to condition on the parameters. And I think this is what you see here, is just conditioning on the parameters. These are different examples for different values of inner matter and sigma eight. And looking again for the mean power, when I say mu p is just like the mean power you, you can calculate you can go look into the camels. The camels has the true values for um, true power. And we have the fake generated power by H1 flow in the blue. And then you can compare them and see whether they agree or not. And you see for different values of omega matter uh, and sigma eight, they kind of similar. So the R squared that is coated in all the panels here in the comparison between the H1 flow and camels, this is basically just the, the, the coefficient of determination, which just tells you how best you reproduce the, the ground truth, how strongly you correlate with that, and how much variance you capture in the data. And what you see here is that they mainly over 90%. Uh, you can make a nice summary. This is sigma eight on the y axis, omega matter in the x axis, and in the left panel is the mean power. The right panel is the standard deviation around the uh, power, and the, it's color coded by the R squared, which is the coefficient of determination. And what you see here is that in most cases, over all the prior range, we are able to score more than ninety percent in all cases, which is really impressive for a model that uh, it's only like thirty minutes on a training on a single GPU. You are able to generate this much nicer accuracy. And now you, you don't need camels anymore. You can just use this to do your parameter extrapolation. So if you want to do any parameter investigations for omega matter and sigma eight, you can do that. In this work, I didn't really include the astrophysical parameters because I realized they have a very weak effect on the H1 map. So that's why I didn't include them. But it would be interesting in the future to... Uh, to include them if the signal or the map you are looking at is really um, controlled by the astrophysical effect. I, I guess when you say you don't need camels, you mean over the range that this has been trained, that as soon as one was to go beyond that, presumably, as with most machine learning, because it doesn't know that, you know, when it's been fitted over a certain range, once you go outside that range, it starts to act a bit funky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the extrapolation always, yeah, it's very... Uh, yeah, I don't think we can trust that, but still it would be interesting to try. If CAMELS is provided some data set beyond the range, and then you can compare with that to see whether whether you can do this. But uh, yeah, of course, you cannot really trust something unless you validate it. If you have any thoughts about what the rest of the cosmology community should take away from your work, what should we change in our behavior or beliefs based on what you've shown? No, I, I think what, what I have shown is that in this paper is that it's a very promising technique to be able to generate this high dimensional data set. And I think we should spend more time thinking about how do we do our analysis at the field level and try to avoid the summary statistics because we lose information through that. And I think this is just the main idea is that it's it's doable, it's possible, because this is the most important thing is that you don't lose information and if you are able to generate these high dimensional data set very quickly, then you can do your analysis at the at field level. And this is what we know that convolution and neural nets, they showed us that is that they, if you do things at the field level, you get the maximum information and you provide the best estimates. So it's something that we shouldn't really be afraid from because I don't think this has been like most of the generative models in the market. It's very hard to find them. They are conditioning on the parameters. And most of them, they they suffer from other things. Like if you do like the general adversarial um, neural nets, they have a problem with the collapsed mode and they don't really generate diverse examples. So normalizing flows, they are very powerful. They are easy to train, quick, 
yeah, and then uh, that hopefully will help us to uh, extract more information than what we do now. Cool. All right. The absolute last question. What still keeps you up at night about this general area of research and what would you want to discuss with, with other experts inside or outside of camels? Yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm mainly interested in the epic of reionization and it's a very interesting field because actually you are forced to think about large scales and small scales from very, very small scales like parsec scales in the ISM, in the interstellar medium to a very large scale gigaparsec scale. You are interested in both cases and I think it's continuation to the same thing. How would we prepare for the future observation? What should we do? What kind of tools we should build in order to maximize the scientific return of the future surveys? And if I want to talk to an expert about something in my field or like in a, uh, in a related area, because I basically work on reionization across machine learning, I think if we are able to, to find a model, machine learning model or something that is able to track the evolution of all the atoms and the photons and everything from a very small scale in the ISM to a very large scale in uh, gigabar sex, I think this is just a dream that I have been thinking about is that how would we have a model that we don't need a subgrid model? And that, of course, will require like uh, very powerful machines, very sophisticated models. But if we are able to connect all the gaps, we can. Is it possible to get like an ISM simulation with the CGM simulation with cosmological simulation all built together to do something? And I think machine learning here will play a, a beautiful part because the camels provided a good data set. It's not enough, but it's a good one. Uh, looking at these and learning these things from different simulations and try to connect them with one pipeline, one longer pipeline, a machine learning model from ISM, from CGM to, uh, to I, IGM, and connect all of them together. I think that would be very, very beautiful. Cool. Well, thank you for, for the interesting talk and, and ideas, Sultan. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very nice. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. There will be a live discussion of all the Camel Talks quite soon, featuring all the speakers plus some invited experts. So please do get in touch if you're interested. You can do that via email from the About page on YouTube or direct message me on Twitter or just leave a comment on this video. There are more Camel Talks in a playlist linked to in the description, plus probably a video being suggested on the screen right now. And if you did like the talk, don't forget to like and subscribe so that YouTube knows to feed you more of this type of content and click the bell if you want to be notified of more cosmology talks.